We're going to continue our discussion on uh, for bias diode models. So we talked about the ideal diode model. It's just the the diode is either uh, completely on or completely off, and it turns on it at zero volts. So if you have even just a slight amount of of voltage across it. Then you can get whatever current you want to flow through the diode. So in our example circuit, if this diode is an ideal diode, there's no voltage dropped across it, and the current through the diode, and in this circuit, is going to be 10 milliamps. And then to make it a little bit more realistic, we looked at the, the constant voltage drop Model. So now we're replacing our diode with an ideal diode in series with this uh, 0.7 volt uh, DC source. And this 0.7 volt source represents the voltage at which a silicon diode starts to conduct a lot of current. Okay, so before using this constant voltage drop model, uh, if the voltage across this uh, these two terminals, BD, is anything less than 0.7 volts, then you're trying to get current to flow the, the wrong way through the diode, and you're not going to get any current to flow through the diode. But once the voltage between these two terminals becomes more than 0.7 volts, now the current arrow is the right way in the direction of, of ID, and now I can have whatever current I want flowing through my diode. Okay, and that's what's shown in the IV curve on the left. So if we use this constant voltage drop model for the diode in our same example circuit, that means the voltage um, across the diode is 0.7 volts. And to figure out the current in volts, minus 0.7 volts over the 1 kilo ohm resistor. So instead of 10 milliamps with the ideal diode model, I get 9.3 milliamps, which is going to be closer to what you would actually measure if you were to make this circuit uh, in the lab. If you want to add uh, a bit uh, more realism to your model, then you can go with this, this piecewise linear model. What this model is just saying is when the diode turns on, when it fully turns on, uh, the slope is not infinite. There's some finite slope to it. So we're approximating an exponential increase in current by a linear slope. Okay, so that is done by taking our ideal diode in series with some voltage and then adding a resistor in series with that. Okay, so once my voltage across the diode uh, VD, the voltage between these two terminals, is greater than the voltage of this DC source, I will get current flowing through this diode. And the more current that I have flowing through this, the more voltage is going to be dropped across resistor RD, and so I'm going to have some, some finite slope to my ID curve. Okay, so if we took some values, so let's just say that uh, VD0 is 0.7 volts and RD is 20 ohms. Then we can calculate our diode current. In this case, it happens to be uh, 9.1 milliamps. And you can use that to calculate what the voltage across the diode will be. It'll be VD0 plus the voltage dropped across the resistor RD. Okay, but all of these so far are just approximations for what's really happening for the current in the diode. Uh, because the, the current is an exponential dependence, it's a little bit harder to calculate. So these are, are just increasing amounts of, of, of trying to add in 
uh, some complexity but still keep it simpler than an exponential equation. But if you want to model uh, exactly what's going on, then we can use uh, our exponential model. Okay, and the exponential model, um, this is already a simplification because if you recall the, the diode current equation uh, that we solved based upon the diode physics is E to the V over VT minus 1. Okay, but if we're, we're for biasing our diode, so the, the voltage across the diode is something greater than about half a volt, then we're going to say that this minus 1 term doesn't really make a difference. Okay, so that's our, our first approximation. So this equation that I just drew the box around doesn't have that minus 1 because it's not really that important in the calculation. Okay, so for our example circuit, if we were now to use this exponential model, in order to figure out the current through my diode, I can write uh, the source voltage VDD minus the voltage across the diode, divide by the resistance, R. So the voltage at this point in the circuit minus the voltage at that point in the circuit divided by the resistance will give me the current through that resistor. The current through that resistor has to be the same as the current through the diode. Okay, so that's how I got, that's how you get this part of the equation. And then the current, that must be equal through the current to the current through the diode, which is given by this equation that is the same as the one in the box. Okay, but I have uh, the voltage across the diode, VD, in this side of the equation, it's also contained in the exponential. So the question becomes, how do we solve this equation now? And this becomes more complicated to solve, which is the whole reason why we went through the trouble of creating uh, simpler models to describe forward bias. Okay, one way that you can solve this equation so here's the same equation. One way is you just keep on guessing and iterating. Okay, so if we start off with, um, we'll, we'll start off with I1, and we'll, we'll say that the voltage across the diode is some V1, and then we'll change that so that we have a new voltage across the diode V2, and that creates a new I2. Okay, and if you take the ratio of that, take the ratio of the two currents, and that, that means we are going to uh, take the ratio of the uh, exponentials as well. So that means I'm just subtracting the voltages V2 and V1 in my exponential. And then I can take, uh, get rid of the exponential using a natural log, and you come out with last equation. Okay, so from this equation now we can just start plugging in some numbers and seeing what we come out with. Okay, so let's make a guess. So let's say that I'm guessing that the voltage across the diode is 0.7 volts and I'll just guess that the current through the diode is 5 milliamps. I don't know what it actually is. Okay, so, plugging those values into my uh, equation for the current through the resistor, and I get a current of 9.3 milliamps, 10 volts minus my guess for the voltage across the dial, which is 0.7, divided by the resistance of 1 kilo ohm. So that gives me 9.3 milliamps. And then this is my equation uh, from the previous slide. So I'm going to use this 
uh, to generate a second value and then I'm going to start iterating. Okay, so v2 is going to be equal to v1. I'm just moving over uh, v2 to the right side of this equation in this part here. Okay, so I have an equation now for v2 in terms of v1, uh, i2, and i1. And my v1 was my guess of 0.7 volts. Uh, Vt is a thermal voltage, so that's just 25 millivolts. And I'm taking the natural log of I2. So this is I2. And my initial guess of 5 milliamps. That's I1. And that's going to give me a new value for the voltage across the diode. This, this initial voltage was V1. Okay, so if I figure out, oops, uh, okay, so if I do this calculation, then V2 becomes 0.71 by 5 volts. Okay, and now I'm going to do this process once again to try to get a more exact value. I'm going to iterate that. Okay, so this V2 of 0.7155 goes back into my equation for the current through the resistor. So my new um, current becomes 9.28 milliamps instead of 9.3 milliamps. Plug that in to find, I should call this V3 now. Let's call this V3. Plug that in to find a new value um, for the voltage across the diode. So it's going to be V2 plus Vt divided by, let's call this I3. So this is I3. And this is I2. OK, so that's going to give me a new value. And V3 is 0.7154 volts. OK, so each time I iterate, I'm supposed to be getting closer and closer to what the actual value is. Uh, actual voltages across the diode. So, but between V3 and V2, it's only uh, a 10,000th of a volt. So I'm already pretty close. So I'm just going to say it's, it's good enough and I'm going to stop iterating. Now between V2 and V1, which was 0.7 volts, you know, I had a uh, 15 millivolt difference. So that was maybe significant enough that I wanted to iterate this third time. But now I'm getting to very, very small differences, so I can stop iterating. I probably I'm close enough um, to what the real value is. Okay, so when I solve the exponential model this way, uh, I come out with a voltage across the diode of 0.7154 and a current through the diode of 9.28 milliamps. So this is a much more exact value for what the current will be through the diode, but you can see it's pretty close to what we got if even if we just use the constant voltage uh, drop model. So a lot of times those simpler models are a good enough estimate of what's going on. But if you want to have something really exact, then you can use this exponential model. And this is one way to solve for it. Uh, a more elegant way to solve this equation, so we're solving this equation, remember that's why we did the iteration. A more elegant way is to solve it uh, using a graph. And you're going to do this for your homework. Okay, so to solve it graphically, we are going to use uh, something called a load line. That's what 
this uh, linear uh, curve is on this graph. This is the load line. Uh, this exponential curve is just your diode equation. Okay, so this equation gives you this line. And uh, your load line is given by the other side of the equation. So where the two lines intersect, this point here, oops, that's where they're equal to each other, so that's going to be the solution to this equation. Okay, so if I draw, if I find the x coordinate for this point, that's going to give me the voltage across the diode. And if I find the y coordinate for that point, that's going to give me the current through the diode using this exponential model. Now, how do we draw the load line? Well, well actually, that's how do we draw this, this diode curve? Well, I need to know what the value of the saturation current is. So if I make, for example, this assumption, then I can plug that saturation current into here, and then I just plot this exponential function. That will give me the diode curve. How do I get the load line? Well, um, this is a, an equation for a line right here. And you know what the endpoints of the line will be by just setting uh, one of the variables to zero. So if I want to know what's the value of the load line when I have no voltage uh, across the diode, that that's corresponds to this point. So that's going to be VDD, the voltage of your source, divided by R. And then uh, the other extreme would be uh, if my um, current through the diode becomes zero, then uh, so, you're, so you're at zero on the y-axis, the intersection point with the x-axis should be VDD. And then you just draw a line between those two points. So, if you were to do the same thing for this saturation current that I indicate here, and to the negative 15 amps, what you would come out with is you would come out with a, and, and plot a load line based upon this 10 volt source and this 1 kilo ohm resistor, you should come out with a diode voltage of about 0.75 volts and a diode current of about 9.3 milliamps. So if you want to check to make sure that you can solve this method, you can just take this example right here and redo all of those calculations and see if you get these answers using this method. Yes, this method is giving you exact values because you are solving the exponential diode equation. Any other questions? This method too, you can figure out uh, what would happen if, it, if I change the resistor value because that just corresponds to a change in the load line too. Okay, uh, the last model I want to talk about is the small signal model. And this model is, is a little bit different from the other ones. So all those other models were modeling what the current is going to do uh, in the diode when it's under forward bias and how that's going to change as we change the voltage across the diode. Uh, the small signal model uh, is a little bit different. 
you don't care about all of that. You're assuming that the diode is already conducting. So the diode is forward biased. There's some current uh, flowing through it. But what the small signal model is looking at is if you then add a AC signal on top of that, that DC voltage and the DC current that's going through the diode, what's going to happen uh, to the voltage across the diode? Okay, so here's the example. Here's an ideal diode. You have some uh, DC voltage across it, this capital VD. That creates a forward bias, so you're going to have some current uh, through the diode already. But in series with the DC voltage, we just add an AC voltage. And then, how do we describe the voltage across the diode and the current through the diode? Okay, well, if this AC voltage is zero, then we just get back to our original uh, diode equation. But if this AC voltage is non-zero, then the voltage across the diode will have two components. It will have the DC voltage component and our time varying or AC voltage component. And so if I write... Uh, this as a lowercase v, but with a capital D subscript. So this includes the, the DC term, so that's the DC term, and the AC term. So this notation is DC plus AC. Okay, so that means um, if I write lowercase i with a capital D for the current through the diode, this is also DC plus AC. And I can use the same diode equation as long as I use the voltage that contains both the uh, DC and AC terms. Okay, so if I do that, I can then expand out um, this to explicitly have the DC term and the AC term in the exponential and then I can divide that up using properties of exponentials into two different terms and then this first part this is just the same as our DC out current right this this term is the same as the, the equation in the box at the top. And then I'm just left over with an exponential depending upon the time bearing part, the voltage. So I can write that the total current in my diode is going to be whatever that DC current is multiplied by an exponential that depends upon that uh, AC voltage divided by the thermal voltage. Okay, so far it's all math. But does that make sense so far? So we don't have a, a model yet. It's just all math. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. There's that equation that we derived on the previous slide. Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to make our model. okay? And in order to do that, we're going to make something uh, called the small signal approximation. And this is, this is the small signal approximation. So we're saying that uh, the, the value of the time varying voltage divided by the uh, thermal voltage is going to be much less than 1, or that time varying uh, AC voltage is not going to be very large. If we make that assumption, then what that does is it allows me to simplify this, this exponential expression uh, into a linear one. Okay, so I can replace the exponential in the top equation by this 1 plus 
um, the AC voltage over the thermal voltage. And that's the small signal approximation. But again, we're, we're, because we're doing this simplification, we are putting a restriction on ourselves. So we're saying that that time varying voltage can only be about maybe five millivolts or so in order to meet this condition that the, the, the AC voltage divided by the thermal voltage is much less than one. Uh, but if we do meet that condition, then we can write this equation, which is an approximation. And we can break it up into a DC component and uh, an AC only component, which is the, the little i with a, with a little d uh, subscript. From this, we can rearrange uh, some terms. So the uh, AC um, current will be equal to the DC current divided by the thermal voltage multiplied by the AC voltage. And this first term here that depends only on the DC and the thermal voltage is something called the diode's small signal conductance. And if we just take the inverse of that, inverse of conductance is resistance. So we can use that to define a diode small signal resistance. That's just the inverse of the uh, conductance. OK, so this stuff down here is the development of the actual model, the small signal model. And I'll have an example on how that is useful. But uh, first, maybe let's look at a, a graphical representation of what's going on. Okay, so the black line is our diode IV curve, our exponential diode IV curve. What we want to know is if we have a small uh, variance in the voltage uh, across the diode, how does that affect the current through the diode? And so that's what uh, this uh, triangle wave represents. It's a, a small peak-to-peak time-varying voltage centered about the, the DC voltage across the diode. And what the small signal model is, is saying at that um, DC point at which you intersect this uh, diode exponential curve, you're taking a tangent to that. Okay, so you're, you're approximating a section of this exponential curve as a linear uh, segment. That's why I can't uh, have a very large time-varying voltage. Because if my time varying voltage spans, say, from uh, 0.65 volts to say 0.75 volts, my line is my line is something like from from this point to this point. So you can see that's a, a pretty significant difference at the ends from the exponential curve. Yes, question. Uh, that 5 millivolt, okay, so this, this, you're talking about this 5 millivolts. Okay, so the small signal approximation is based upon this condition. This is the thermal voltage. So this is uh, a temperature dependent uh, voltage that's just based on the properties of the PN junction. So um, it's going to be for, you know, no matter what the rest of the circuit is. This, this thermal voltage is going to stay the same. Now, it's going to be different if you're not working at room temperature, but we're always going to work at room temperature in this class. Uh, just a quick question about thermal voltage. Um, is that going to be given every time, or do we, is there a number we should go uh, So you should remember that at room temperature, the thermal voltage 
is about 25 millivolts. It's actually closer to 26, but 25 is close enough. It's easier. It's a nice round number. Uh, there is an equation for thermal voltage that I think is given in the book. But like I said, for this class, we're only going to consider room temperature. So it's always going to be at that temperature. So when you solve for it, it's always going to give you the same value. So you might as well just remember what the thermal voltage is at room temperature rather than calculating that equation every time. Anyway, so that means that as long as we're working at room temperature, uh, this limitation that, that the, the AC signal should be less than 5 millivolts is going to be valid. Okay, so that means that if it's 5 millivolts or less, then that means it's we're containing this, this variance to a very small section of this linear curve. So it's still a good approximation to the exponential curve. And then if you want to figure out what the current is, you could do it graphically by just, um, you know, how they did here. You draw where um, the edges of the time varying voltage intersect this curve, then just draw out uh, uh, horizontal lines orthogonal to those points, and then you, your, volt, your current is going to vary by that amount. Okay, so that's graphically what the small signal model is doing. Okay, now let's look at some circuit examples um, for the small signal model. Okay, so let's say that we have a diode connected to a uh, 10 volt power supply. So this, this VS represents our power supply. 10 volt DC power supply, but this power supply isn't a very good power supply. So it's supposed to be 10 volts DC, but on top of that 10 volts DC, there is a 1 volt peak uh, ripple at 60 hertz. And so let's say that we, okay, our, our diode at um, 0.7 volts across the diode, it conducts a current of 1 milliamp. And let's see what the voltage is going to be across the diode because of this power supply and its ripple. Okay, so let's look at um, the circuit at DC only. So we'll assume, we'll make an assumption that um, the voltage across the diode is going to be 0.7 volts. And this is this is this part of the circuit represents our power supply. So there's a, a DC component of 10 volts, and then this is our, our AC ripple of 1 volt and 60 hertz, but we're looking at DC only, so I zeroed that out. Okay, so let's solve for the uh, current ID. So how do I figure that out? I'm saying this is 0.7 volts. Yeah, so ID is going to be volts minus the voltage across the diode 0.7 volts divided by this 10 kilo ohm resistance so you get 0.93 milliamps okay and we said that if the diode current it's based on these diode properties that I gave you the diode current is a milliamp then the voltage across the diode is 0.7 volts so let's build up our small signal model. So we're going to find out what the small signal resistance is of this diode. So that's equal to the thermal voltage divided by the diode current. Thermal voltage is 25 millivolts divided by the diode current that we just solved for. And you come out with a small signal resistance of about 27 ohms. Okay, so now we can use uh, this small signal model to figure out what's happening to the circuit when we add in that AC component. Okay, so now let's look at the circuit with only AC there. Okay, so I'm zeroing out the, the DC. DC is now zero volts. And I'm just adding the AC component, which is one volt peak. 
at 60 hertz. Um, and now I want to find out what the voltage is across my diode. Okay, so voltage across my diode is going to be what I'm going to do with my small signal model is I'm going to replace this diode with its small signal resistance. And then I can use that to model what's happening to the diode in this circuit. Okay, so now if I want to figure out what the voltage is, the AC voltage is across the diode, it's just the voltage across the small signal resistance. So it's a voltage divider, so it's going to be RD over RD plus this 10 kilo ohm resistor times the, the voltage of the source, which is 1 volt peak. Okay, so if I plug in 26.9 ohms for RD, I come out with a voltage across the dial of 2.6 millivolts peak. Uh, 2.68. Okay, so this is what the AC component of the voltage will be across the diode. And this is less than 5 millivolts. So it's okay. It's okay that I did this small signal approximation and replaced the diode by its small signal resistance. If, if I come out with some kind of large value, then probably my small signal approximation isn't occurring anymore. Okay, so what that means is, um, so my small signal approximation holds, and if I want to know what my voltage across the diode is, it's going to be given by that 0.7 volts DC across the diode plus my time varying small signal. So since I'm expressing this in volts, even though this is millivolts, so I, I, I'm converting it to volts. Um, and it has a, a period of, of 60 hertz. So this will be the equation for the voltage across my diode, given that I'm hooking it up to this power supply with the 1 volt peak ripple. Any questions on this? Okay, so that, again, is, is small signal, so it only works uh, for small voltages. We still can use diodes with large AC voltages as well, but then this small signal model doesn't apply anymore. Um, but there are very interesting applications of using diodes with large AC voltages. And that leads into our next topic, which is uh, diode rectifiers. Okay, so what a, a rectifier needs to do is it needs to convert an AC voltage um, into uh, a unipolar voltage. So AC, you have a, a portion of the time where your signal is positive, a portion of the time where your signal is negative, and that just repeats. DC, your signal is always one polarity. So we want to convert from that AC to the DC. And the reason why we want to do this is we want to power a lot of our electronic devices um, are going to be operating off of DC. So, but, our, but our wall circuits are at AC. So we need to be able to convert from AC to DC in order to power our electronics. And this is the way that you do it. So all of this stuff, uh, this is a block diagram of all the stuff that's contained into say like an, an AC to DC adapter that you would use for a laptop computer. All of this stuff is con contained in that, you know, that black uh, rectangle. So if you plug it into the wall outlet, your wall outlet is 120 volts at 60 hertz. 
the first thing you need to do is to step down that voltage because your laptop does not run at 120 volts. Um, and you can do that using a transformer, which we discussed a little bit in EE211. But the main job of that is to step down the voltage, and it's just two mutually coupled uh, inductances. You can um, determine what the voltage will be at the output of the inductor, Vs, by looking at the ratio of the windings uh, in this side of the transformer. So this will have a number of windings, N2, and the input side of the transformer will have a number of windings, N1. Okay, so if I just control the ratio of those windings, I can control the voltage at the output of the transformer. Okay, and this is what I'm doing to my signal. I started off with an AC signal on the input of the transformer. I still have an AC signal on the output of the transformer. It's just at a different voltage. And the next block is the important part for the diodes. Okay, so this is the diode rectifier block. And what you're doing is you're taking this AC voltage and making a unipolar output. So from this, this voltage that varies from positive to negative depending upon where you are in the cycle, now you have a voltage. Once you go through the diode rectifier, you have a voltage that's only positive. Okay, it still has a, a varying uh, voltage level as time goes on, but I don't swing down to negative voltages anymore. It's always just positive. So it's like I took all the negative uh, portions of the cycle and just flipped it up. Okay, that's what the rectifier does. But this is still not DC. So you then run it through a filter that will smooth out these pulses. So look a little bit more like DC. Then there's a voltage regulator and that job is to, to um, stabilize this even more until you get your DC voltage at the output of the voltage regulator. That goes to your load, which is your, your laptop or whatever. Okay, so a key component of all of this is this diode rectifier. And we're going to learn about uh, how to make a rectifier using diodes. Uh, this next slide is kind of uh, a historical background to all of this. So if, if all of our electronics are running off of DC, why is our, our wall voltage at AC? And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, a, a, it, it's more efficient. You get less loss in transmitting power over long distances if you can transmit the power at a very high voltage. Okay, but what that means is when it gets to your house, you can't use that high voltage, right? You can't, if you have a kilovolt, tens of kilovolts coming into your house, that's way too high a voltage um, for any of your appliances. So you would need to step down that voltage. And using this transformer, it's very easy to step down an AC voltage. These are just coils of wire next to each other. So it's, it's easy to go from a high AC voltage to a low AC voltage. You, we can do that in DC, but it only became really convenient once we had semiconductor devices. And if you think back to when they had the first light bulbs, they didn't have semiconductor devices at that time. So if you wanted to transmit electricity at high voltage, um, it became easier to do it at AC. And that's why we still have AC for our grid. Uh, there's not too much loss. Okay, so let's go back to the rectifier. The uh, simplest rectifier is you have an AC source, you have a diode in series with that and in series with a resistor, and you just take the voltage across that resistor. 
and this world provides some rectification. Okay, so this is going to be the voltage of the source as a function of time. And if we look at what's happening uh, to the diode, okay, so let's say um, that my voltage uh, at the source is positive. So what does that mean uh, for the diode? What kind of bias is it under? In this, half, in this positive part of the cycle, then what's happening to the diode? Okay, so the diode is forward biased. In the positive half of the cycle, that means there's some current flowing through the diode, and you get some voltage across the resistor R. But if we go to the negative part of the cycle, what happens to the diode? So now the diode becomes reverse biased, and so there's no current through the diode anymore. No current through the diode means there's no current through the resistor, so the voltage across the resistor should be zero. Okay, so if we were to plot the output voltage now as a function of time, this is what it looks like. These positive uh, voltages correspond to the positive parts of the sine wave, and it goes to zero whenever the sine wave voltage goes negative. Then once it becomes positive again, you start getting a positive voltage at the output. Yes? Now the resistor is your load. This is what you're trying to deliver the voltage to. So yeah, if you're going to measure, um, yeah, actually, if you think about it, if you just put the diode there, then what would happen? So let's make the circuit. Let's make this our circuit, okay? And let's plot this voltage. Oops. Let's plot that voltage now, down here. This is testing your knowledge of uh, what's happening with diode biasing now. Okay, so positive part of the cycle, what's happening? So, uh, yeah, zero volts across the diode if we're using the ideal diode model. If you want to use something a little bit uh, more realistic, I'm going to increase, I'm going to follow this increase until I get to 0.7 volts. And then it's not going to change anymore. Because even though my voltage increases, I just get more current through this. I'm in that exponential part of the curve. My voltage is not going to increase much more than 0.7 volts. Okay, then I come back down. Now when my uh, voltage goes negative, what happens to this voltage? Yeah, just be the same. The current is zero. But the voltage is not zero. And so that's what the circuit would look like with only the diode there. So it's not working as a rectifier at this point. OK, so we need that resistor there, and that, and that resistor also represents our load. OK, so in the positive parts of the cycle, we will get a positive voltage delivered to the resistor. In the negative half of the cycle, we just have zero voltage delivered to the resistor. So it's called a half, wa half wave rectifier because my wave is only delivered, or my, my signal is only delivered to the resistor for half of the cycle. 
And uh, this is a, a, a slightly more complicated model of what's going on. If we, this is sort of like an ideal dial model. Now, if we replace that by that constant voltage drop model, um, the black is, is my source voltage, and the blue is the output voltage. So it takes a little while for the output to come on because my source voltage has to rise to 0.7 volts before I actually forward bias my diode and then I get voltage across it. Okay, so the, the output voltage is not going to be exactly the same uh, as my source voltage if I have a more realistic diode model that, that takes into um, that, that the constant voltage drop model there. And these equations um, describe all of that. Okay, this is not maybe the most attractive way to rectify a AC voltage, though, because I'm throwing away half of my signal. When my signal is, is negative, I'm not doing anything with it. I'm just not getting anything at the output. So there are other types of rectifiers, but full wave rectifiers, and we'll, we'll go through that a little bit more in the next class, but in this case, the negative part of the signal also becomes a positive voltage at the output. So we'll talk about how this works in the next class.